Okay, so uh, welcome back everybody. This is the third session for the Brocade uh, Virtual Symposium. Thanks for joining us. This session is multi-path versus multi-chassis. As many of you know, uh, we are looking at the new era of LAN networking where once upon a time everything was driven into spanning tree and it was a rigidly defined, rigidly session. So in the first session, if you've just come to us here, we had an overview of how the uh, spanning tree forces us into an invariant design position where the hierarchy comes like this. And then the use of uh, fabrics, especially Brocade's VCS fabric, allows us to create a cloud of networking. So this session then drills into how the multipathing VCS fabric works and the differences that we're going to bring in. It's going to be a more open format, open structured kind of uh, discussion. And we've got the, uh, the virtual whiteboard is made real. We've instantiated it here in the boardroom to have a much more dynamic discussion. And joining us in a session, first of all, is Mr. Ivan Pippen. Uh, okay. <laughs> he's coming back again for those of you, and also introducing... Joshua Bryan. Uh, he blogs at... Staticnat.com, and I'm on Twitter at JoshuaBryan77. And also joining us is... I'm Chris Margit, and I'm at Chris Margit on the Twitter. Cool. Uh, thanks for joining us. Good to see you, by the way, in person. Not, not too often we actually get together and see us. And uh, wearing a stunning mullet today is... <laughs> Tony Burke, uh, yeah. Data Center Overlords, and I'm on uh, Twitter at, uh, at T Burke, T -B -O -U -R -K -E. Okay, and returning is... Uh, chip Copper, uh, chip at brocade.com. Yep, and of course I'm Greg Farrow. You can find me at etherealmind.com where I blog and write, and on the Twitters as Ethereal Mind, and of course also at Packet Pushes. So uh, without further ado, let's just hammer off into some topics around uh, multipathing versus um, who, who wants to head off with a bit of a discussion around how Trill Fabrics do multipath? Ivan or Chip? Um, I'm sure, I'll yep. talk about it. Yep. <laughs> The first idea here is that we have multiple ways that different components inside the network can be connected to each other. And so the idea of shutting off a communication path just doesn't work. So what we have to do is we have to look at solving a couple different problems. Interestingly enough, before we get into it, Trill solves half of the problem that we need to discuss. Trill solves the uh, multi-path, multi-hop issue and we depend on data center bridging to solve the other piece of the issue, which is the lossless behavior. So for a time being, let's ignore the lossless behavior piece and let's just concentrate how things are going to go through the network. As was pointed out in the previous session, routing's the way to go. The ability to go multi-hop, multi-pathing, the ability to dynamically and somewhat intelligently go through and figure out the best path through the network is absolutely an optimal network design. The difference is that we don't want the host to know about it. So as we start to talk about Trill, the most important thing about it is that as far as the, the edges are concerned, nothing has changed. The frames that they're going to send out are going to continue to be the source ID, the destination ID of where they want to go with the payload, and we're done. In the meantime, what's happened is the different nodes that are going to be participating inside of this uh, Trill fabric, now known as R bridges for routing bridges, are going to have exchanged routing information going back and forth. There's a bit of a religious war going on about what the routing protocol should be because the, in the very early versions of the standards, they said that in order for these bridges to communicate with each other, they need to be able to exchange routing information. How do we do that? And the early versions of the standard said, well, they should use a link state routing protocol like, say, ISIS, ISIS, a, a, a fond protocol for those of us who remember <laughs> the early days of Digital Equipment Corporation. Yeah. DECNET Phase 5. Exactly. It was great. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I know I wasn't around for DECNET Phase 5, but OSI. Ah, oh, yeah. The whole model. Yeah, still there. That. We still talk about it. We just don't use them. No. <laughs> so, so what we're going to do is we're going to have each one of the nodes figure out who their neighbors are, and then they're going to exchange according to a link state um, table. Now, the reason I bring this up as a, a little bit of a religious issue right now is there are a lot of people who are saying, what link state routing protocol do you use? First thing I'd offer is that if you care about that, you're still down in the weeds. That I think that there are different ways that we can say we need to be running a link state routing protocol, and it needs to be one that we can agree upon so that different nodes can communicate with each other, especially in a multi-vendor environment. But the important thing here is that they can interoperate. And so although um, ISIS happens to be the one of choice for Trill, that doesn't mean that it necessarily is, is put in stone. The other thing that's significant about this is it's not really ISIS. It's actually a variant of ISIS, where we've had to change some primitives and so forth depending on what the network's going to do. 
So we certainly believe that that's a standard that's coming forward. There are other complications about bringing in third-party switches, which we probably won't have a chance to talk about here. But the important thing is here, there are standards that are out there. And um, old guy story, <laughs> does anyone remember when TCP IP first came out, it took about seven years for interoperability to take place. That yes. when we yes. got TCP IP, it was remarkable because vendor A's didn't work with vendor B's. And in one case, vendor M made the stack for vendor I, but vendor M's and vendor I's stack didn't interoperate. I think one of the things that's, that we're seeing right now is that we sort of expect instant interoperability the moment we see things coming out onto the, uh, on the market. Well, we but hope the vendors have learned a lesson or two in the last 30 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so that, to me, is actually a really interesting topic because um, networking is driven by standards, yet servers, applications don't. So when Microsoft writes a C compiler, it's actually not C compatible. It's their version of C. That's right. Okay. Now, uh, we've seen um, different companies in the market space create or adopt the Trill standard, but then enhance it with their own proprietary extensions. So they claim that they are, or they would say, you know, we are compatible with the standard, but we have this whole bunch of extra extensions that allow us to be fancy, but they're proprietary. That's right. Right. And then we have uh, in the, and that, you know, that, so Cisco's Fabric Path, for example, is Trill plus some set of extensions, which is their Fabric Path strategy. Um, Brocade has chosen to go down the path with their uh, VCS, virtual uh, cluster switching which is the name for your fabric strategy. That's right. That's correct. And there, your fabric strategy says we use uh, ultimate, absolutely Trill standards, but the routing protocol that we use to transport, to, to, to spread the MAC routing information, the MAC address routing information, uses FSPF. That's right. Today. Today. But it is, is it your stated direction to move into ISIS in the future? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, for us to be able to go to that routing protocol, it's just a matter of reflashing the firmware. Mm -hmm. We go to customers and say, do you want us to go through the effort? Yeah. Now, the reason we have it that way, by the way, is because, as I mentioned earlier, we only had to link, have a link state routing protocol. The reason we picked FSPF is actually for the efficiency of the switch. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to already be running fiber channel over Ethernet traffic, fiber channel over Ethernet also requires FSPF. Mm -hmm. And the idea of going into existing uh, fiber channel SANs said, let's use the same routing protocol. Well, since we're already running one protocol, mm -hmm. why not use it for both troll routing and fiber channel routing? Yeah. But as we do really see interoperability taking place, and we can now have multiple vendors putting together troll networks for us implementing um, ISIS is going to be very straightforward. Yeah. So uh, it also is worth pointing out that uh, the interoperability is usually a red herring. It's someone trying to stop the sale. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I have nothing against interoperability. I'm all for interoperability. But VCS fabric today is how many switches at the most? Um, very temporal, but check it out. Today we'll say 24. But, okay. please, but please check no, back because no, no. that's a sliding scale. Absolutely. Scan. So we are talking about interoperability of something that has at the most, at the moment, 24 switches. Yes. Are we stupid? Mm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, right now, in terms, to get the benefits of this, uh, of the uh, being able to have this multi-pathing Ethernet technology, I, I really don't care about interoperability right now. I would like it in the future. But right now, I'm not going to build a huge, uh, I'm, if I'm going to build um, an Arbridge network, I'm going to use one vendor. I mean, it, just like if I build a, a data center, if I use multiple vendors, I'm not going to intersperse them between each other. I'm, I'm going to have like a cluster of switches mm. here and a, a group of switches here. I might, I might and have there are three switches on the top from whichever vendor. <coughs> yeah, so I have, I have the, you know, my core will be one vendor and my aggregation and, and access layer might be different vendors, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to like have my A switch and my B switch, one vendor and another vendor. So in terms of interoperability, right now I just don't care. That's right. Now the good news on all this is from a frame format, as was pointed out, 100% compliant to the standards, so far as the standards have been defined. Yeah. And I bring this up, one of the problems with, with TCP IP is that everybody's was standard compliant. No one's was interoperable. Because <laughs> you can't write standards that are exact enough. And that's why I think that uh, when data- you can. Uh, <laughs> takes 20 years. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, that's right. I think one of the things that was brilliant when uh, Lossless Ethernet was coming out was that at the same time data center bridging was being developed, there was a reference architecture called CEE, 
converged enhanced Ethernet that also came out as a freely available standard. And the idea being that wherever the standard was ambiguous, go look at this reference implementation. And whatever they thought that counter meant, that's what the counter means and that's how it's going to be used. Unfortunately, Trill followed a different path. Mm. And so what that means is today, because there are all these different variants that are out there, a lot of people can say we're standards compliant and yet there's no interoperability. In the long term though, we would expect some level of interoperability between vendors. I think it's, it, that's yeah. absolutely going to be driven by the market and I agree with you. Yeah, so the, you know, if you're watching, make sure you demand the vendors to be interoperability over time to make it into, you know, I think that's important for the industry as a whole because it may be one day that you need to interoperate. You will have a multi-vendor network and if you haven't got that functionality then your design choices are limited. Now it may be you may not get certain enhanced functionality. So for example, uh, the Brocade VCS strategy has an auto configuration capability or what? I'm not sure if that's your term for it. Uh, but if you plug in a bunch of Brocade switches, they will detect the neighbor, that the neighbor switch is a VCS capable chassis and then just bond up and automatically trill enable itself, self-configure almost. That's right. Right, completely. And, and that's, um, I must say, we would actually came to uh, Brocade uh, six months ago. We, we actually got to play with that mm. in a live demo. And I just, it took me a little while to twig exactly what had happened. And literally, you just light them up, you plug them together, you turn them on, and they go, ah, that's a Brocade. That's a VCS enabled, and Trill turns on. And it's really that simple to run Trill. Now, as Ivan will leap in and say, there's an awful lot of magic going on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, uh, you see, Greg, actually, thanks for mentioning this particular example. Mm -hmm. I'm really disappointed at all the vendors mm -hmm. who are not doing that. Because, after all, we have LLDP that has been standardized for I don't know how long. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty simple to detect that there is a switch at the other end of the link if you are using LLDP. Mm -hmm. Now, why can't you auto-provision that link with some sensible set of defaults that I could configure as a template? Mm. And I mean, if we look historically <laughs> back, some of the greatest successes in Ethernet networking have been auto-configuration. So, um, not wishing to you know, bring another vendor in, but you know, we look at ISL and dynamic trunking protocols you know, in the Cisco network, people just plugged them in and then they started trunking and then they created VLANs and VTP signaled the, you know, and today it's a curse <laughs> word to automatically propagate VLANs around the network. But in its time, and I, I remember deploying VLANs in, you know, 1999, and it was an extraordinary amount of work to convince, to, for people to understand how to configure VLANs. People didn't grok the idea of a VLAN. Right. So, you no, know, those automation technologies have a powerful effect for adoption of the technology. Yes, and they do. Yeah, and they drive the market in that direction. That's right, mm -hmm. and, and 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 people can start, and it just works, and then they go, well, maybe I should start to understand it more, and, and then they drill okay, into so the technology. Anyway, now that you've mentioned VTP, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it was a first attempt at doing something, and mm -hmm. they obviously went way too far mm -hmm. with the ability to a random of a random switch to you know erase the whole mm -hmm. fabric, if you wish, wish to call it that way. We've learned in the meantime how far we can go with auto configuration. So, yes, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah, I think people liked VTP, but there was that danger there, and so that's why people stopped using it. I, yeah. I mean, it was brilliantly con convenient, but also potentially Dangerous. very hazardous. Well, um, just to defend that, back in 1998 when I started to deploy it, there weren't that many big networks. It was five or six switches, and now you and people have five or six hundred. The, it didn't scale. You know, it didn't have the defenses that it might needed to have. So the good part about VCS technologies is that, or Trill, is that that's part of the calculation of the standard. That's right. Right. So it allows for up to uh, it has mechanisms in it that is, makes it safe. So the people who put design Trill and took it to the standards body is they built in fail safe so that things don't overrun their intention. That's, that's exactly true? right. Yeah. And, and there's always going to be an element of proprietary. For example, although we speak Trill, and although we understand lags and VLAGs and so forth, we still have a, an admittedly proprietary differentiated protocol, so that if I have a link that's running between a pair of switches, and I plug a second link in, it's automatically going to figure out not that that's a lag, but rather that now I can combine those two links, and on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, I can do load balancing across them without having any manual intervention. Okay. Oh, you should really explain that in more detail. Should we? Let's hit the whiteboard. Yeah, yeah sure. Because this is one of the amazing features of VCS fabric. 
Right. It's frame by frame and not flow by flow. Exactly. It's frame by frame. That's wow. exactly right. So yeah, the question it's, it's, there would be, wow. what, how, do we, how do we make sure that we get in order frame delivery, which is important, especially for things like fiber channel? Now, I'm going to give him, uh, forgive me. <laughs> now, you're close to me, so I should be careful here. <laughs> Don't strike me when I give you this answer. Okay. okay. The answer is, we've been doing that for 15 years. In, in the fiber channel world, the type of trunking we're going to be discussing here has been out now for a decade and a half. So we know it works, and we know how to put it together. It's just a matter of introducing this technology into the Ethernet world where this whole idea of how are we going to do it is, is, is dangerous. It sounds dangerous. So the good news here is this is not an experiment. This is not something new we've come up with. I, I, for 15 years now, I've been doing exactly what you described, and we address that issue. Okay. So, so that's the good news. It's just a matter of getting Ethernet people used to that. But I appreciate your comment, and thanks for graciously <laughs> letting me give you a snotty answer. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason this is different, let me know if you can't see this. Suppose that I have a switch here and a switch here. And um, on this, can we see this? Does it look good? Oh, excellent. And so on this, I'm going to have an ASIC, because the, the ASIC is essential here because I don't have the opportunity to go in and do this manually. If I have to go to a control plane to do what I'm going to show you, everything is going to slow down. That's part of the piece here that says it's going to be differentiated. On these ASICs, I have these things here that are called port groups. And what these port groups are is inside of the ASIC, uh, because one of the ways that you scale the number of ports is you actually have multiple collections of modules inside the ASIC uh, where there's a very tight relationship between some of these ports. And so what happens is, I'm going to start with the case you'd expect first. If I have a link here, and then I go in here and I connect the link here, I've now got two links going between these pair of switches. What will I form here? Well, I'll form a lag, right? And I'll yeah. form that because I have two separate ASICs, and it looks exactly like it would in any other device. For anybody who doesn't know, a lag is a link aggregation group. And it's, uh, it's a port channel. It's a port channel or an ether channel, but it's basically two physical connections between switches bonded into one logical. Two or more. Which, two was, or more. which was a trick that we used to get around spanning tree limitation, or Ethernet <laughs> limitation, yep. which normally required spanning tree. <laughs> so we tricked it into thinking it's one link instead of two. It, it solves several problems. It gives us double the, double the bandwidth at the same speed. And it's useful for spanning tree to avoid some spanning tree loops. Well, and it actually doesn't give you double the bandwidth, which was the original question, yeah. because if you have one huge flow, it's you have one source to it, it, it require. In order to use okay. both links, we require Let me explain a that. variety of source and destination addresses. So in Ethernet networking today, you have two devices. Oh. That's right. You have a marker that doesn't work. Um, in Ethernet networking today, you have two devices, and when you put them together and you bond the two into a port channel, the conversation is a steer this way or this way. And a given IP destination source will either go left or right in a two-port yeah. channel. And so your maximum speed is always determined by this link. So if they're two one gigs, then your maximum speed or network speed is at one gig, but your maximum bandwidth is two gigs. That's as a long as short explanation. Right? And right. that's also why we need, usually we want to keep it to powers of two. So two, four, eight, yeah. rather than three, five, or six. We'll get into that. but. So for those of you who are perhaps coming from a different vendor's approach, um, that's the way we know it and that's the way we understand it, just to set a background on which to go. That's exactly right. And because of the way that we decide to go left or right, if I have an unfortunate hashing scheme, then what can happen is that this link over here gets terribly congested while I've got almost no traffic that's going over here. And because I don't want to allow the possible out-of-order delivery of those frames, I mandate, especially for TCP flows, that everything go over exactly the same path. So what happens here is this, we were talking about interoperability. In the case where I'm hooking up to either different ports in different AC groups or another vendor switch, this is exactly what it looks like and this is the behavior that you get, so it's very expected. LACP, everything standard, they figure out they are in a port channel or lag and they work. It's exactly right. Everything looks exactly the same way. But suppose that now what I do is I have two different lines like this and I connect them to the same what's called a port group on these two separate switches. As soon as I do this, they recognize through some low level signaling that they are on exactly the same ASIC and now they use a different form of load balancing where on a frame by frame basis, they actually put 
I get into a little bit of the details, they actually put a little bit of a shim as they transmit the frames from point to point so that now this does look like a single link of the combined capacity and I can use an algorithm that basically says as a new frame comes in here the shim goes on and then I'm going to look at these two lines in whichever line doesn't have any traffic going across it that's the one I'm going to use and so then the next frame comes in does it go to this one or does it go to this one it could go to either one depending on which one is currently busy and so what that means is I see a very even load balancing taking place between here and there so that now for example this looks like in this case, assuming 10 gig links, this looks like a single 20 gig link. This is interesting because now we start getting into the costing of these things. The question is, well, if I can do that and it looks like a 20 gig link and with arbitrary loads, arbitrary hashes, I can get this thing all the way up to 20 gigabits per second, then now um, do I really need to have faster individual port speeds? It's an interesting comment. For example, suppose I have four of these things that are moving back and forth. Yeah, do I need 40 gig? No. <laughs> do we need 40 gig connectors? That's exactly right. Because you would need four fiber cables anyway. Could we, could we run three instead? Absolutely. Yeah. And the thing that's nice about this is you can just scale on demand all the way up to eight. So in, in a, back to my earlier, can, so if you have a, if you have a you know, an answer to this, I'm, I'm fine with it, but sure. initially hearing this, my concern is that, all right, well, what if a frame gets held up in a queue on one port versus another, fires at the other end in a different order? That would yep. be my concern if you have a... The shim helps us resolve that. Okay. And remember, there's other communication that we can have between these ASICs, and the other thing that hopefully makes you feel good is again the fact that this technology came directly from what we are doing on the fiber channel side so we have 15 years of experience of knowing how to arrange that so the situation that you just described doesn't occur so you okay. can uh, guarantee in order delivery on both ends absolutely okay as long as you do that I'm, I'm Tony, uh, what they're actually doing is if they if you want to transmit the frame on one link mm -hmm. and the frame with the same hash is already tra being transmitted on the second link they delay this frame. Okay. They will start transmitting only when they're sure that the other one will be received prior to this one based on their length and the difference between cable lengths. They even measure the cable lengths. Okay. That's right. As a matter of fact, we have, they're called de skewing registers. Yes. That sit up here so that we can actually watch everything and we periodically send pings. We send like race car mm -hmm. Drives here, and we can have one line that goes this way and one line that goes direct, and we can still guarantee the reliable in order delivery coming off the other end. Okay, yes, so sir. now what I want to do is scale that out to a multi chassis lag or an M lag. So we have a, a you, new. You I'll don't push. need that. No, but what we're talking, the, the point of the discussion is to compare multi pathing versus multi chassis, right? Okay. So this is a feature <laughs> which says, yeah, <laughs> so, so we want to expand the conversation inside of the time available. So what we now have is a second switch here, which now acts to multi-chassis lag. How does that look? So the first thing that we have to do is we have to make sure that whatever we do is something that's going to look like a reasonable Trill network because the minute I go off of this port group, I'm back to what Trill will allow me to do. So in that case, let's come down here. We have another port group. Maybe I'm going to take two that go down here. In this case, this now appears to be two completely separate lags. And I'm going to use ECMP across these two because I don't have this special sauce that lives in here. So as we started to talk about Trill, we talked about how a Trill is going to have this link state routing protocol. The piece we didn't get to, forgive me, I digressed, was that uh, there is once again going to be a shim header that's going to be put on at every single hop going through the network. And that's going to dictate, for example, for this particular ASIC, where do I send the next piece of traffic? And in this case, this next piece of traffic uh, can go either up here or down here, depending on the hash that I'm using for this lag. Here's where it gets really interesting. Fabrics are going to have boundaries. So for example, suppose now that this is all one fabric, and I've got this traffic that's moving through this fabric. Ah, <gasps> an eraser. Yeah, How timely. yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And let's suppose that I now have a network that's already in place and I want to have these two devices communicate with another 
let's say a logical host that's up here. Let me, let me draw that bigger because we might want to do something that's a little different. Let's say that I have, and y'all can still see that? That's remarkable. <laughs> um, suppose now that we have a single entity that I want to talk to, and now I'm going to have one link that goes up like this and one link that goes up like that. The question is, as far as this device up here goes, and this device up here, it's important, notice that it's outside the boundary of my fabric. This could be a brocade device, it could be a Juniper device, an Arista device, a Cisco device. It could be anyone else's device that needs to or be. Or a host. Or, um, or host. The question is, what does this now look like to this node? And the answer is, as far as this node is concerned, it's all the same thing. And so now that means that just as I can have these lag groups going between nodes down here inside of a fabric, as far as this thing is concerned up here, this is in fact one node. Yeah. So Trill's going to handle the, how nodes or how traffic is going to go through here, but to the outside world with technologies like multi-chassis trunking and so forth, mm -hmm. this looks like a single entity here, mm. this looks like a single entity up there. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that if I do actually have two protocols going back and forth like this. These two, let's say that this is running multi-chassis trunking or VPC or VSS or some other protocol in here, some IRF, some <laughs> proprietary <laughs> protocol. <laughs> and isn't it interesting that down in here, along with Trill, we're running some sort of proprietary protocol. In this case, the net effect is the same. I need to have a tree because it's going into an existing network. Therefore, this needs to look like one node. This needs to look like one node. <laughs> and so here, I can actually have multiple nodes yep. that appear to this node to be the same. So at this point, this is, this could be, you know, uh, some other vendor. That's and this is LACP. That's yes. right. Ch pure, standards compliant, LACP. Absolutely. Uh, and this On becomes your VCS boundary. Yeah. And then in here is a trill. Uh, yeah. Trill core, right? Is is what, what you call your multi-chassis protocol VLAG? Did I get that right? VLAG. Okay. Yeah. And on how many different devices can you co uh, terminate one lag? Check the website because I don't know when <laughs> you're watching. Mm. Check yeah. the website. Today it's five. Okay. So that means isn't that interesting that up here we pay a <laughs> lot to the ability to have two of these chassis work together to look like a single node, and yet down here in this environment, I could go one, two, three, four. I can have a fifth one that comes up here. These all look and behave like a single node. And what you'll find out, again, is we didn't get into pricing a whole lot, but what you're going to find out is that the pricing down here is about what you'd expect to pay for, I'm going to say, current layer two devices running without any fabric infrastructure that these things, but please check with your local sales team to get the latest pricing, all those kinds of things. <laughs> but, I want to ask uh, a clarifying And you can question. find them on brocade.com. That's exactly right. <laughs> I want to ask a clarifying sure. question. As we come out of your guys' um, stack, your fabric at the bottom, and then we go up into this, this host or this other vendor's environment, that standard LACP, that goes back to standard flow-based. So flow goes left or flow goes right. It now is not per frame-based. That's exactly right. I just want to right. make that, that consideration yep. if people don't look at it and well, still see, think that's magic. See, what's important about this, what's important about this approach is there's a transition from your current network. So if you've got a pair of, um, let me try, am I right to? Oh, yeah, yes, please, please, please. <laughs> so if you, um, oh, it was such a nice picture. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it is good, but that's okay, um, we can draw it well, again. I wanted to ask a few questions about that picture, so thank you. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Imagine you if you would, a series yeah. of <laughs> <laughs> So let's say you have a network today and you're running a, a vendor's MLAG solution. So MLAG is multi-chassis link aggregation and that's technologies which take two physical chassis and make them act as one. So between the two physical chassis you've got some sort of protocol between here, so there are many different names for this. VSS is one from Cisco, uh, IRF is one from HP, and it's a generically sort of an industry approach. What it does is takes two physical chassis and turns them into one chassis. So that means you can have two cables going down here to a an access switch and then your server connects to that and this looks like, even though it's two physical chassis, it looks like it's actually one, just to back off a little bit. But let's say you want to trill enable your core using Brocade's VCS, you're now at a situation where you have two switches over here and you can then say, we have the uh, six point, we don't want the <laughs> non-dynamic, non-pentangular yeah, non, uh, non, non <laughs> type of thing. And so we then, uh, we hyper-connect these. I call it hyper-connecting is when we flood 
the true connection between. We'll talk a little bit more about that perhaps in a, in a future thing. So when we connect here, this then becomes your, probably should have gone with a different color, this becomes your VCS edge. So at this point we're running VCS in here, which is concomitant with the term of trill, right? If you wish to talk about it in that sense. This is an LACP industry standard bundle. So you've got an existing vendor's MLAG at the edge, and it looks just like that. That's exactly right. Right, now, point two in a network is you might have an existing single switch, right? And you hot dual connect it to the trill core, and this is a spanning tree. That's right. Right? So this is spanning tree, and so this would be well, we'd be running a lag, but it's it we still yeah, we could run a lag, and, and then we wouldn't even need to run a spanning tree. That's right. Okay, so we could still run this as a lag, or you could run it as a spanning tree where it's an active. Oh, now no, no, this is exactly the picture I needed. Right. Ah. <laughs> well done. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Greg's not so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so now you might have this situation. Tell me when I go wrong here because I'm starting to get a bit creative. And now I might have a server down here where it actually has the active standby. So this is the active port and this is the standby port. And at that point, you've now got a transition from this and to encompass your existing things and create a trill enabled core. And then you have, you know, the fan out continues off to the other side. That's exactly right. Okay. So if you can replace all of this with a single box, you can do it with the cloud. Yeah. yeah. Now, the advantage of something like that is suppose we still want to have the edge core aggregation. And suppose mm -hmm. out here I have a series of racks. And let's say I roll the first rack in, here's my top of rack switch. I roll the second in, my second, my third, and so forth, and all of a sudden I start thinking, you know, I want to grow my aggregation layer, where does it live? Well, a piece of my aggregation switch may live here. Another piece of my aggregation switch may live here. And so what that means is as we scale out the environment, I don't have to figure out how to dig out a big piece to put this large chassis in. Instead of that, I just have to have enough room as I add more chassis to add the next incremental layer. So you can almost think of this as being a way to have a large virtual chassis without, um, with all the management features of a large physical chassis. By the next incremental layer, do you mean the seventh node in that mesh? Um, in this case, it would be the next rack that I'm going to roll in. Just the next rack. The next rack, and then the next rack after that, and the next rack that's after that. So you're almost talking like a deconstructed core. Yes, that's exactly right. So you get rid of the, the three layer that we talked about having over the years, but you end up with this deconstructed core that is kind of this one layer that exists at every top of rack and then communicates through trail. So this is in October, so I don't want to go too fast to scare anybody. So today I'm only going to be talking about aggregation and edge. But the concept of saying, can we have similar things happening with a core? Stay tuned. Well, it depends on how big your data center is. If you only have a few hundred servers, you don't need more than what you have here on the whiteboard. That's exactly right. And that's if when... If you're Facebook, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> so suppose that... Oh, we good? Can yep. I erase uh, uh, ah. leave, the, leave the green part. Okay. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> no, you had a beautiful picture I left picture your part up here. I, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. No, no, you, you had the beautiful picture before, and then he erased that, and then he almost redrew it. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing that's neat about this. Suppose I already have, up here's my core, and here I have, I'm going to call it distribution here, just so it's not ambiguous mm -hmm. with access, and down here I have access, out here I've got access. And maybe I've got some um, MCT or some VSS or something like that that's running in here to kind of distribute this virtual porch channel. So now the question is, how do I organically grow this? So that, um, so that I can incorporate fabrics. And the answer to that is down here, you bring in your first fabric switch. Now, what have I done to the total switch count here from a management viewpoint? I've added one. So this goes into this rack, and now I bring in the second rack. What have I done to the total switch count from a management viewpoint? Nothing. Because now, since this is a fabric, these are going to look like a single switch. I may be adding some additional links for bandwidth or for a high availability, but it remains the same. Now I add another rack that's out here. The same thing can keep going on. At some point, it's going to be time to add the next piece for my uh, distribution layer or my aggregation layer. Where does that go? Maybe it doesn't have to exist as a separate switch anymore. Maybe now what happens is it appears down here as just another component that fits into this fabric, and that feeds my core. So now, uh, the thing that's actually happening from a networking design viewpoint is our jobs just got harder. 
not because we've made it more difficult, but because where there's only one way to do it, this layer can only talk to that layer and we're done, mm. it's easy. Choice is a tough thing. So now we get to the situation of saying, well, do I really need to add another switch up here? Can I add the switch down here? Do I have a lot of east-west traffic that's taking place in here? So Thank I really you. Don't really <laughs> I was getting that vibe. You know what I'm <laughs> and with all this east-west traffic, I don't have to go up anymore. So this is the place where my next generation application is deployed, where I have federated virtual machines causing the same thing without needing this infrastructure. And yeah, the problem you have here is that now all of a sudden you have to understand how much east-west traffic you have and how much bandwidth you need on those links. That's right. Yeah. And the key here is to be able to measure it. Mm -hmm. I mean that and have predictive behavior. Yes, sir. So while you're collapsing um, the tradi uh, traditional structure everyone's used to, um, I think what I, I think you're kind of glazing over is that there is inherent structure with that row of switches um, that you have the line drawn through. What see. is the inherent structure there? In here? Yeah, between those four switches. How do you, if you're going to build out a network of switches, of F switches, uh, what is that going to look like? It's not going to be four switches in a row. What is the cabling? What is the structure of that network? Outstanding question. And I, I have to, can, do I have time for a story? Absolutely, yeah. We all got time for stories. Okay. <laughs> it turns out that, um, I hope I won't get in trouble for telling this, but we were actually going to, to show a commercial a while ago. And it got such a, a uh, reaction from networking people, we actually stopped the commercial. What the commercial was, was it showed a bunch of switches that were sitting there and a bunch of little kids. And we said, okay kids, go build the network, yay! <laughs> and they all ran in and they just plugged in things nilly-willy and it all worked. And then we said, okay kids, go change it, yay! And they did it and it still all worked. Now, I'm telling you that because what I'm telling you here is in this area, the thing that's going to dictate how I put those switches together isn't going to be, well, architecturally, A needs to go to B and B needs to go to C. Instead of that, the way that these four things are going to be put together is the way that the application and the workload needs for them to be put together. Let me give you a few examples. If you examine, and this is where uh, your point about measuring the workloads mm -hmm. is so important. You have to be able to characterize this to do it effectively because you have choice now. Suppose I have four nodes. I can hook them together in a ring. If that's the right topology where, for example, neighbors are only talking neighbors, maybe I'm doing some sort of FFT calculation this or something. Is, this is good for VDI. Well, uh, for VDI, there we go. It may be that because any can talk to any and I want no latency, I'm gonna hook them together using a complete mesh. It may be that um, I'm going to, and again, forgive me for not exhaustively going through these, it may be that what I really want is a hypercube. So the question is, who are the people who can best determine exactly how these things should be laid out? The good news is, is for the last 15 years, the, a shameless plug, can yeah. I do a shameless plug? Yeah, please do. <laughs> for 15 oh, no, years. I, I know where this is going. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> bear with it. Here, I think you, you may need a napkin too. Right? <laughs> But bear with me. The, the answer to this is for 15 years in fabrics, people have been solving this problem, which is why today what we're seeing happening, which is a really uncomfortable dynamic, is when it's time to design these racks using fabrics, we're seeing more and more people, especially from the hypervisor level, saying, let's get the sand people in here. Not because they're sand experts, but because they're fabric experts. And they know that because you can lay switches out any way you want to, doesn't mean you should. So let's bring them in, let's figure out what the right traffic flows are going back and forth, and let's engineer the network. The good news is, this is a little scary, I, I'm, like I said, we need thunder outside to talk about these things. <laughs> the scary thing here is, you're allowed to be wrong. And the reason you're allowed to be wrong is because if I happen to notice that I've cabled this incorrectly, and I've got an inordinate, oh, let me erase this. I've got an inordinate amount of traffic going between the two, or there's something about the deployment of my applications that requires more bandwidth than here. I just go in and add more cables. Yep. So I just wanted and to. And they're all used. Yep. So that comes back to this thing here. They're deliberately. Oh, well, that's, that, 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 that's one of the questions. Okay. So are they all used? So you might say, I've got a set of applications on the other side of this, right. and I've got some sort of cluster over here. Maybe you've got, you know, and you need to exchange data. So the question is, you might plumb this, 
and say that's enough. And you know, obviously, but you might only say have you know some arbitrary architecture like this, and that might work for for all cases of work. And then you suddenly realise that over here somebody's actually added some more elements of a Hadoop cluster, and they need to talk to this cluster over here. So now in a in a Trill core, you can now start to do things like just scale that out to give well, you more this bandwidth is, from this, this point. This is to this where point. my set of questions starts. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, so the first question would be: uh, Let's assume that I have equal cost multipath. Yes, sir. And then I figure out that the links are overloaded, and I just add a new parallel link to one of the links in the equal cost structure. Yes. So. I guess you do uh, take the bandwidth of the links in account. We take the bandwidth into account for load balancing, not for routing. So that means that a... a please, please. Yeah. If you have, let's say, uh, okay. you have a topology like this, uh, but, but here you have high bandwidth links. Yes, sir. You have LACP here, LACP here. Yes, sir. So, all of a sudden, this looks like wh wherever it comes, it, it, it's equal cost multipath. Going from here to anyone to anyone down here. But effectively, because this link is thicker, so to speak, it shouldn't be equal cost multipath. But if you make it equal cost multipath, then this link will be underutilized. I think that what you'll see there is that if you look at the individual links in each one of these trunks, they'll okay. all have approximately the same workload, assuming a perfect hash scheme. Within the lag? No, actually across all of them. Because if they all have the same rounding distance from here to there, okay. that, then that means that all of them are going to be considered. If all of them are going to be considered, then the way the hash algorithm works is, let's say I have five links from there mm -hmm. to there. Mm -hmm. The way that it works is, I'm going to draw a number from one to five. Mm -hmm. If it's one through three, it goes here. If it's four or five, it goes here or here. So that means if I have a good hash algorithm, I'm actually using all of those links going from there to there. So but you're also at the mercy of other vendors' decisions in their hash mechanisms as they come into the LACP. You can have an incredibly yeah. high bandwidth flow coming into the top part of that fabric that never takes into account the bottom part of the fabric where the higher bandwidth path is. And this is where SDN and those solutions come into play as overlays. Yep. Um, but again, for SDN to have incredible play, even in this model, and I don't want to harp on this too long, you then have to go back to having true equal cost lags everywhere, which means lots of infrastructure, lots of cable, cable once architectures. I mean, this is cool stuff, but it, it's, not in, it's not inherently without, without challenges from the outside world. How do I fix that? Oh, you go, you go strictly to a brocade product get, and get everybody's rid of this. <laughs> and, and, and to be more gentle, this goes to Trill. Yeah. So for our, our, our bridge routing, the, the ECMT, the equal cost multipathing, is still at the mercy of a hashing algorithm. It is. Uh, and it, that's fine, but just wanted to... It is. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a single hash algorithm. For example, one of the things that we figured out, if we have a truly unfortunate set of hashes, then, um, then we can actually change the hash algorithm. We can change some of the salt that's in there. So if I have, distribute the load. So if I have one host just blasting out one TCP session from one side to the other, no matter what how the hashing algorithm I'm going to use, if it's just one flow, it's still going to go over one of those paths. That's right. Yeah. And that's and that's un and that's pretty well understood. And that's fine. Okay. That's right. But you're also going to have that same congestion issue on one of these links, and also hmm. coming into these links. Okay. Yeah. Now the other point to notice here is just to come back to the thing, this is a multi-chassis solution. When you build a multi-chassis using an MLAG like this, um, you have a coherence between the control planes. So you have two switches here, they have a control plane and a management plane which has to be synced into one. So there's a synchronization protocol between here and here. And this requires cleverness, extreme cleverness at some point. Whereas using a trill based solution, each of these is an autonomous and distributed system. So it's something that most networking engineers are familiar with. That is, there's a control plane here and a control plane here, and they're using Trill over SFPF, FSPF to exchange routing information. So the MAC address in a Trill core, when your MAC actually comes up and into the fabric enabled, uh, you know, the, the Trill enabled switch, actually gets encapsulated and routed across the core. It's not 
forwarded across the core. And that's part of the secret of Trill, of course. And so there's a, a significant difference between multi-chassis where you're actually taking just standalone, two standalone switches and trying to go <laughs> weld them together to make them one. That's right. But it's not a perfect, it's not tightly integrated. It's a loosely coupled. You're trying to, you're either disabling the forwarding engine and the control plane in one or the routing engine over here and saying everything's over here and then you're distributing forwarding information and, and then you, you have these active detection mechanisms to try and make the two look like one. This is, in a realistic sense, this is a more robust design because the failure of this does not create a concomitant failure domain with this device That's because right. it's, it's, it's autonomous unless it's you know, oh. a routing problem. Or Which brings me to another interesting question. Uh, let's say you're running LACP with outside devices. If you want to do that, then obviously both of your fabric nodes have to pretend to be the same node yes, sir. from LACP purposes, which is fine. Now let's say the fabric falls apart. You have two fabrics all of a sudden. Yes. Uh, will those two devices still pretend to be the same device to the outside world, so you would have a split brain scenario? You've hit on something which is, I think, the crux of, of interoperability, mm -hmm. because I think that's so vital and that's a piece that people, I think, forget. And that is that a fabric is not just a collection of trill switches, that in fact there's distributed configuration management and so forth that's going through here. Snotty answer. Sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'll have everyone alienated by the time I get this done if I do this right. But, but the answer is, a decade and a half ago, we figured out that there needs to be a, a sense of fabric coherency that goes on where, for example, the minute I see the light blink out or the minute that I see something is going on here, I start to register fabric events, which means that a huge piece of keeping something like this working in the coherent fashion you talked about, for example, if this was just a trill network, distributed lags or multi-lags wouldn't work. Exactly. It's that additional layer of, I guess, special sauce that goes between these two that awesome allows that sauce. to take place. So a trill network is not the same as a fabric. There's a lot of other protocols that go on. In our case, what will happen is the minute that fabric is separated, both fabrics are going to say, something just happened here. What did I lose? And how do I adjust myself appropriately? Is that That's a very important point. Is that special sauce based on DCBX, or is that something different? It's based on something different. Okay. And that's why awesome for, sauce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's basically based on the higher levels of, it's scary, fiber channel-ish protocols to talk about fabric services oh, 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 as oh. opposed to node forwarding services. Okay, now now that we are in the fiber channel of the world, ah. okay. <laughs> so if the fabric splits, yes. do I get fabric resets on both ends? If you're running FCOE, yeah. yes. But remember that in the majority of these implementations yeah, that we're seeing, there what, is no what FCOE. Happens to, what happens to, the, to my trunks? Will fabric reset call L, uh, cause LACP reset? If I have separate links going like this, yeah. then the answer is they sure better. Because mm -hmm. then it wouldn't be compliant. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think if I have a, a, a split brain in the fabric, all my port channels will also go down, and they will be reestablished in whatever way is still consistent with the state of the fabric. That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay, I think we might have covered this topic. All right, I think so. And I'd like to thank you for watching. Uh, so that's a just uh, pretty rapid, pretty detailed discussion on multi-chassis versus NLAG. Uh, if you'd like to get some more information, I suggest you get to the Brocade website. There's a great white paper there, which I've read myself on the VCS uh, technical brief, which is uh, I read and I got a lot of good information from that. I'd like to thank our panelists, especially Chip, for joining us for this. Uh, you should remember that there are four sessions in this portfolio. Session one, which is the open view. Session two, which is where we talk about converged storage. We have this session, which is multi-chassis versus uh, multi-pathing. Of course, Trill being the multi-pathing and Brocade's VCS, which is a multi-pathing technology. And session four, which is where we'll be talking about virtualized networking, which is hard cores and soft edges. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in those presentations and thanks for joining us.